Hi, welcome to the video. My name is Mr. Kandasamy. In this video, I'm going to go through the May 2021 Edexcel higher tier paper, physics paper 2, or if you're doing the combined science, it's paper 6. This video covers both uh, the combined science and the separate science uh, papers. If you're doing the combined science, please note that uh, question 1, question 4, 6 and 9 will not be in the combined science paper because these topics are not tested. Let's move on to the first uh, question. Every question you are stretching up like a story. I'm While not I'm stretching doing things, anything as a story. I just was question one is on static electricity. Uh, this is a topic which will not be in the combined science paper. So uh, move on to question two if you're doing the combined science. A student gives a plastic strip and overall electric charge. Describe one way that the student can give the plastic strip and overall electric charge. So how do you give an electric charge to the plastic strip Use, using friction by rubbing it with another cloth or another material. Figure one shows a gold leaf electroscope that can be used to investigate static electricity. So you have a metal cap and there's a metal rod attached to it and there's a gold leaf here. Now the gold leaf, they're all metal. So if they both get the same charge, the like charges will repel. So it will actually move the gold leaf away. So the electroscope has no overall charge. The gold leaf has a very small mass and can bend very easily. The student brings a negatively charged strip near to the cap of the electroscope. The gold leaf bends away from the metal rod. Which diagram shows the way that electric charge is now distributed? So. So you've got the negative charge rod over here and if that's negative all the electrons should flow towards the bottom this is fine but except that they haven't showed you the charge which is on the top here it cannot be positive this is most likely correct because the positive charges which is the metal ions will remain on over here and the electrons actually flow down so the answer is c next question Figure 2a shows another gold leaf electroscope that has been given an overall negative charge. The student connects the metal cap of the charged electroscope to earth with a piece of wire as shown in figure 2b. So here you've got negative charges. So the entire thing is negatively charged. So if I draw negative charges over here. Remember like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So what happens when you connect it to the earth? The electrons will flow through the metal, through the wire to the earth. That way it will actually be earthed. So that means that it's not going to be charged anymore. So the gold leaf falls back. So explain why the gold leaf has moved. The gold leaf has been discharged. So the electrons have moved. To the earth through the wire yeah so we can say it's been earth so the gold leaf is no longer repelled next question see two small objects p and q are each given an electric charge figure 3 represents the electric fields around the objects p and q so use information from figure 3 to give two differences between the charge on p and and the charge on q so what type of charge is p and what type of charge is q so remember like magnetic fields electric fields also have a direction and it's always from the positive towards the negative so because this is going towards this point charge this is negative and this is positive that's the difference sorry p is negative and q is positive and like in magnetic fields the number of lines indicate the strength of the uh, field so here you have far less lines whereas in q there's far more lines so P is negatively charged, whereas Q is positively charged. Charge on Q is larger 
then that on p so we can make some notes here i'll write the notes and i'll let you know what those notes are so the direction of electric field is from positive to negative the strength of the field is a greater charge means greater concentration of electric fields and it's similar to the magnetic fields going back to the question object p and object q are held near to each other so that the electric fields interact with each other state the effect that the electric field of object q has on object p so q will attract p right? state the effect that's all they're asking so remember like charges repel opposite charges attract that brings us to the end of question number one let's have a look at the marking scheme ma'am do not uh, touch anything right now wait. if you don't if you don't listen to me how will i fix wait, it up now wait are you listening to wait me? wait could you explain to me I why my bank said it was an internal transfer that's no I, I know but i what do you mean it was a glitch it's it looked like it was transferred why ma'am if you over talk me how will i do it ma'am so you, what do you mean you did everything it, so you did the internal transfer internal transfer why would we do internal question 1a use friction they are looking for the word friction in the answer and 1a part 2 is the option was c and the electrons move with one, one other point has been discharged so it's no longer repelled and charge on q is greater than that of p and p has a negative charge whereas q is positively charged and attraction on p from object q let's have a look at question number two do you hear me ma'am yes yes question two figure four shows the results from an experiment where the potential difference or the voltage across a filament lamp was varied now remember if you're doing the combined science this would be uh, would be the question first question in the paper this is the june 2021 paper 2 or paper 6 higher tier so the voltage and current are measured so you have the current here in milliamps and the voltage in volts describe the relationship between the current and the voltage as shown so for two marks you need to say what this relationship is so the first point is much easier so as the voltage is increased the current also increases this point most of the students will get is a second mark that a lot of students miss out what do you need to get to say for the second mark you need to describe this relationship and right? it is non linear if it was linear it would be a straight line with a positive correlation But you could say this is an additional point, but gradient decreases as ED increases. Now, this graph is actually part of a current voltage graph where you can make some notes let me make some notes and i'll show you what these are so as part of your notes these three graphs are very important they can ask you questions now the graph that you're seeing above is actually just this section it's for a filament lamp but if you go into the negative values it's an xs shape graph for fixed resistor which is an ohmic conductor the gradient is uh, is constant because the resistance is constant for a diode the graph shape is actually like this I could actually extend it doesn't stop at zero it actually goes 
on the negative it's always zero and then on the positive it, it takes a little bit of time and then increases rapidly next question use the values of the voltage and the current at point p and q on the graph in figure four to complete the table so they're asking for the voltage and current in milliamps at point p and q so let's go back to the graph so at p is one volt the current is 20 q is in between so that makes it 3.5 and that's about somewhere there and that let's say that's 43 and the voltage is 3.5 so the voltage is 1 and at q it was 3.5 the current was 20 and it was 43 over there next part of the question calculate the resistance of the filament lamp when the voltage is 4.5 volts and the current is 51 milliamps now 51 milliamps needs to be converted to amps which is milliamps equals 51 times 10 to the power minus 3 amps so you need to use that value so voltage is 4.5 divided by 51 times 10 to the power minus 3 that gives you a value of 88.2 in two significant figures that would be 88 I write the answer as it appears on the calculator 88.2 next question explain why the resistance of the filament lamp changes as the voltage across it changes now here they are asking why does the resistance of the filament lamp change as the voltage across it changes now what happens to the resistance the resistance increases and there's a couple of reasons for this resistance depends on the number of collisions between the electrons and the metal ions now even you increase the current which is a rate of flow of charge and you increase when you increase the voltage you're increasing the current because they are proportional to each other they're linear so when the current increases the flow of electrons increases the number of collisions increase that means more energy is transferred between the electrons and the metal ions so they start vibrating more so let's write all of this into the answer resistance of lamp increases as ed since the temperature of the filament lamp increases this increase in temperature is due to the increased number of collisions between the electrons and the metal ions now this answer is more than enough for the three marks that uh, is available for this question now it might feel a little bit incomplete so let me give you some notes for this so here's some additional notes to make it much more clearer so as speed increases so does the current which is the rate of flow of electrons so more electrons flow faster there would be more collisions energy of electrons would be transferred to the metal ions causing them to vibrate more which translates to increase in temperature now let's have a look at the marking scheme just hold on don't touch anything as i told you and allow me to do it you hear me yeah i hear you that's it just it. said it was an internal transfer. I don't understand. That's why I told you not to touch it. It was so simple, ma'am. I did not touch it. I was going to try to look at what was happening. I was going to try to cancel the charge. Don't try and do anything, ma'am. Don't try and Can do I anything, Can I see the charge on the accounts? Right now, oh you cannot gosh. do anything because you're not listening to me, ma'am. I am obviously listening if to you. If you touch your mouse, we will not be able to do anything with the server. That was not your account. We work with lots of accounts in the server and it got missed match because of the black thing well then I stop putting it, up the black screen that's what i've been asking from I the beginning not. i didn't no, touch anything why would you see, accuse see, me see. of touching i didn't touch anything i was trying to cancel
the please chart. Listen to me. Please, why will you cancel? We did it. We have to cancel. You're not listening to me again. You're not listening to me, ma'am. You're over talking me. I am. Now, don't touch anything. I'm not touching anything. Make sure you don't touch anything, ma'am. Look at this. It's the money. Yes, I will show it to okay. you, ma'am. I will show it to you. You're not listening to me. Leave your mouse so that oh, I can if I show it to okay, you. Okay, it's okay. Okay, got really small there for Just a second. Leave it. Yes. Okay. Because it's from the server, ma'am. If anything happens, you will end up losing your money and then you will be again tense. Then I will have to Okay, I don't want to lose my money. You. That's so I don't want that to happen. So okay. I don't want that to happen, ma'am. You understand that? So Question three is on the partial model. Uh, this is the June 2021 paper. If you're doing the combined science, uh, this will be question number two. Describe in terms of particles two differences between a solid and a liquid of the same substances. Now you can actually talk about a couple of differences. So you can actually talk about the movement of the particles, the energy of the particles, the space between the particles, or the arrangement. First point particles in solid vibrate about fixed positions but move freely in liquids particles in solid have regular arrangement but not in liquids particles in solid have less energy than in liquids or particles in solid have less spacing than in liquids the particles in solid are much more compact together. So any two of these points is actually fine to get those two marks. Figure six shows the dimensions of a solid block of concrete. The density of concrete is 2,100 kilogram per meter cube. Calculate the mass. They have given you the equation. So you don't have to do any rearrangement. So the mass, the density is 2,100. The volume is the length times the width times the height so 0 0.2 times 1 times 1.5 that gives you an overall value of 630 630 next question part c figure 7 shows a shed made, made mostly of concrete blocks state two practical ways to reduce the heat loss from this shed so i'm going to make some uh, notes on the diagram it's much easier so here we can add loft insulation or wall insulation now for the wall you could also add padding which is basically another material like a skin on top of the wall so it creates a gap between the wall and that material you can paint it white. You could add draft excluders at the bottom of the door. You can add double glazing to the window. You could make the walls thicker. And on the outside, you could burn trees. Right? Now, why are we doing all of this? Now, this loft insulation reduces convection, heat loss by convection, the white paint by radiation here. It reduces convection plant planting trees acts as wind barrier thicker wall is to reduce heat loss by conduction and this is also by to reduce heat loss by conduction so we can write any of these any two of these points so let's pick out two points so add cladding or insulation to the walls you don't have to say why you're trying to do it but it's good to say it anyway to reduce heat loss and use double glazed windows on a very cold day the temperature of the air is minus four degrees celsius calculate the value of this temperature on the kelvin scale now remember zero kelvin equals minus 273 degrees celsius or zero degrees celsius is 273 kelvin so minus 4 degrees is 269 kelvin 269
that brings us to question number at the end of question number three let's have a look at the marking scheme question number three a the particles in solids are closer together the particles in uh, solids are have fixed positions but particles in liquid uh, move freely particles in solid have a regular arrangement and liquid have more kinetic energy so i mentioned all of those four points and 630 was the mass of the concrete block and we identified all of this use cladding use double thickness of concrete use uh, white paint plant trees to act as a windbreak use double glazed windows or close windows and doors are properly and they have mentioned draft exclusion as well so let's have a look at question number four apology I don't want you to because write last an apology. Time you did it. Just one moment, please. Why yes, did you yes, take yes, all yes, the money? Zero. Why? We did not take... Again, you're not listening to me, ma'am. Again, you're not listening Another to me, Another mistake from your end? Are you kidding me right no now? No mistake Another at all. Another mistake? No mistake at all. It's, you're not letting me speak. You took all... Somehow... Not me somehow... Uh, you're somehow. not letting me speak. You're not letting me speak. You're not letting me speak, ma'am. Please let me speak first. Please, ma'am. Question number four is on forces and matter. Figure 8 shows some water in a tank. The bottom of the tank has an area of 0 0.8 meter squared. The force on the bottom of the tank due to the water is 2400 Newton. Calculate the pressure. Remember pressure equals force divided by the surface area. So if I substitute these values. 2400 divided by 0 0.8 that should give you a value of 3000 pascals more water is added to the tank explain how the pressure on the bottom of the tank changes for two marks pressure increases why is this as there is now a greater force on the tank bottom remember this is for notes more water means more mass that means more weight which is more force this links to the equation w equals m g so when you increase m weight increases weight is also a type of force next question Figure 9 shows an object at the bottom of the tank. Draw an arrow on figure 9 to show the direction of the force exerted by the water on the surface of the object at point X. So by point X, the force is going to be perpendicular to the surface. So you need to draw a perpendicular line with an arrow pointing that way. So they have asked this question in different forms in the last couple of years. So let's make a note of this. Force always acts perpendicular to the surface. And what this means is if Let's say it's a balloon. Right. The pressure on the walls is always perpendicular to the surface. If it's a liquid like in a conical flask, like this, the pressure is going to be perpendicular to the bottom and then 
perpendicular to the side surface like this. Next question. Part B. Figure 10 is a graph showing how the atmospheric pressure changes with the height above sea level on the sur Earth's surface. An aeroplane descends from 6,000 meters to 2,000 meters. Use the graph to find the change in atmospheric pressure. So, from 6,000 to 2,000. So, what is the atmospheric pressure at 2,000? That's 80. The atmospheric pressure at 6,000 is 50. So, the change. So, at 6,000 meter, it is 50. So, descends from 6,000 to 2,000. So, 50 kilopascals at 2,000 meter, it's 80 kilo pascals so there's a difference of 30 kilo pascals so just one reason why the atmospheric pressure is greater at 2000 than at 6000 so the reason for this is air is more dense at 2000 meter than at 6000 meter next question 11c shows two drawings of the same person on the bed explain why the person exerts a different pressure on the bed when standing up than when lying down so we can start the answer by saying pressure equals force divided by the surface area so same force applied that is the weight of the person in both situations but surface area of contact is smaller while standing up so pressure is greater remember pressure is inversely proportional to the surface area and pressure is directly proportional to the force so if the surface area is small pressure is high let's have a look at the marking scheme question 4a the answer was 3000 pascals and when you add water there's greater pressure due to the greater force due to the water and an arrow perpendicular to the slope sloping slide and pointing towards x which you got right and plus or minus 30 kilopascals and greater density of atmosphere greater depth of atmosphere greater temperature so we wrote this as the uh, our answer this point that brings us to the end of question number four let's have a look at question number five the server no, no, no. is just as bad as wreck it Ralph. Side. <laughs> but server cannot apologize to you. Do you have a pen and paper? Can you grab hold of one, please? Question 5. A student uses plotting compasses to inve investigate the magnetic field between the poles of two bar magnets. Figure 12 shows one of the plotting compass and one of the bar magnets. So, in the plotting compass, remember the point. 
that's north and that's south so here we don't know which side is north and south the student places two magnets on a piece of paper with a pole of one magnet a few centimeters away from the pole of another magnet the student places two plotting compasses on the paper near the magnets figure 13 shows the direction in which each of the plotting compasses point so draw two rectangles on figure 13 to show the position of the two bar magnets label the north pole and the south pole so that would be one mark and one mark for this one so you can see that the arrows are actually pointing somewhere here so the end of the bar magnet of one of the bar magnets should be here and the end of the other bar magnet should be at this point and the direction is always from north to south so that should be south and south and this these two ends will be the north poles here's a bit of notes for the magnetic field lines if it is north and north it's actually like poles repel so the, the pattern is the same the direction of the arrows is different so it's pointing away from the north towards, towards the south and if it's a bar magnet the magnetic field lines is away from the north towards the south so all these lines are actually point towards the south next question the student wants to determine the shape of the magnetic field for a larger area around the magnet describe how the student could continue the investigation using just one plotting compass so using just one plotting compass this is one question where a lot of students struggle to get all three marks now the easiest is actually to support your answer using a diagram so if i draw a plotting compass next to the bar magnet and show arrows that might actually help your answer a little bit so first point place plotting compass on one end of the magnet on a paper to mark the direction of the field with a dot on the paper three move the compass so the end of the needle is now pointing to the marked point O repeat steps two and three till you reach the other end of the magnet last point join the dots to reveal the overall shape of the field now there are other methods to that you can actually use as well but uh, you can write that as part of the answer but we can actually make some notes on it 
So you can sprinkle iron filings on the paper with the magnet below. Tap the paper so iron filings along a line along the magnetic field. Now here the question is asking using one plotting compass. So you'll have to stick to the answer that I gave. Next part of the question. Two long thin magnets are held with their north poles facing each other. The force F between the magnets can be calculated using the equation. K is a constant value. D is the distance between the magnet. The magnets are 4 centimeters apart. The force between the magnet is 1.2 Newton. Calculate K. So you need to rearrange it. So let's substitute it first. So F equals K divided by D squared. So which is 1.2 equals k divided by 4 squared rearranging it k equals 1.2 multiplied by 4 squared that gives me a value of 19 now the unit you can use a different color pen now I'm multiplying the force which is in Newton centimeter multiplied by centimeter so it should be Newton centimeter square now I could have changed it to meters because I can give whatever unit I, I want I can actually just leave it as it is the magnets are held the same distance apart but with the north pole of one magnet now facing the south pole of the other magnet so here you have opposite poles so it should be attracting value k does not change state how the force would compare with the force in part 9 so force would have the same magnitude but in opposite direction so you could say it attracts let's have a look at the marking scheme so as you can see the two ends of the bar magnet is south pole and south pole and for question 5a part 2 place a plotting compass on the paper and mark direction of the field determine how the field continues from that point connect field lines to reveal the overall shape so overall if you can give give a description which translates this information then you should get those three marks 19 was the value of k and newton centimeter squared same magnitude at but opposite in direction will give you the mark for the last part let's move on to question number six question number six is on forces and their effects this is for the physics paper only so if you're doing the combined science just skip on to the next question a student investigates moments of forces figure 14 shows the apparatus used so you've got a magnet here which would weigh is down in the anti-clockwise direction And this would weigh it down, pulling it in the clockwise direction. The pivot is under the center of the rod. A magnet is fixed to one end of the rod. A piece of modeling clay is fixed to the, under, uh, the other end of the rod. The system is in equilibrium. State the relationship between the moment. So you're simply asking you to state. So the answer would be sum of clockwise moment equals sum of anti clockwise moment you could say due to play and due to magnet so 
because these two moments are equal the system is equal equilibrium next question this part of the question links to the electromagnetic induction so the student fixes a coil on to the bench under the magnet as shown in figure 15 so here you have a coil of wire so that's going to produce a magnetic field which is which can either oppose or attract this magnet over here depending on the direction of the current the coil of wire is connected to a dc power supply so the current so there's a current in the coil to bring the system back to equilibrium the, the student hangs 0 0.05 newton weight on the rod 8.4 centimeter away from the pivot so you the student has increased the overall clockwise moment this way so if you're trying to increase it this way that means the coil is actually trying to pull the magnet downwards calculate the size of the force between the magnet and the coil so we can find out the moment on this side it should be equal to the moment on this side so clockwise moment equals anti clockwise moment the clockwise moment remember moment equals force times the distance so 0 0.05 multiplied by 8.4 should be equal to the force on the magnet multiplied by 12 so 0 0.05 times 8.4 divided by 12 should give us the force which should be equal to 0 0.035 newton 0 0.035 Part C. Describe how the student could develop the investigation to determine if the size of the force between the magnet and the coil is directly proportional to the size of the current in the coil. So if it is directly proportional, if you were to plot the graph, it should be a straight line like this, going through zero. So extension and the force. So describe how the student could develop the investigation so they're asking for a method so first point change the current in the coil in brackets we can say different values of 0 0.1 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 amps. You could use an ammeter to measure the current. Use an ammeter connected in series to the coil second point adjust the weight distance from the pivot each time so the system is in equilibrium. Three, calculate the force each time, the same way that you would have done above. Four, Plot a graph 
if graph is a straight line passing through the origin then it's directly proportional next question the student reserves the direction of the current in the coil describe how the student could bring the system back into equilibrium without making any changes to the magnet so if you reverse the direction of the current right direction of force changes so instead of it attracting it repels what can you do to balance it and you could say move the weight to the other side of the pivot between the magnet and the pivot remember let's make some notes reversing the current reverses the magnetic field in the coil so it is now repelling the magnet which is in the clockwise direction so anti-clockwise moment needs to be increased that's why you move the weight to the other side of the pivot let's have a look at the marking scheme 6a they have given it in the same way that we have done in the form of an equation and the force was 0.0 Three five newton and measure the value of the current measure the force or distance vary the current restore equilibrium calculate the ratio between force or you could say plot a graph of force versus distance graph and the graph should be a straight line this is what we've actually said in answer 6d move move the position of the weight to the other side of the pivot that's what we've said that brings us to the end of question number six. Let's have a look at question number Question number seven. This is the fourth question in the combined science paper. Two cyclists ride on a hilly road and go through points P, Q, R and S. The diagram in figure 16 shows the, how the vertical height of the road changes during the journey from P to S. The greatest overall change in gravitational potential energy for each cyclist is between which two points in the journey. Now remember, gravitational potential energy, GPE equals MGH. It depends on the mass, gravity and the height. So in this case, it is the height. So at P0, you need to find the biggest height difference. So between P and Q, that's... 20 meters from there to there q and r which is from there to there that's 5 10 15 meters p to s that's basically from there to there that's 10 meters r to s that's from there to there that's 5 10 15 20 25 meters so the answer would be d because that's the that's where the greatest change in height is happening the total weight 
of one cyclist and the bicycle is 700 newton calculate the total amount of work done against gravity when the cyclist travels from point p to q so work done equals force times the distance moved so the distance moved from p to q so p to q is 20 so 700 multiplied by 20 that gives me 1400 joules next question no that's not 1400 is it it's 14000 yeah because it's multiplied by 20 not by 2 next question the gravitational potential energy of the cyclist other cyclist changes by 11250 joules when traveling from q to r from q to r it was 15 meters calculate the mass of the cyclist so we can use the equation triangle to rearrange it but let's substitute the values gp is 11250 equals the mass which is what we are trying to calculate gravitational field strength is 10 and the height is 15 now if you are struggling with rearranging equation you can remember you can use the equation triangle gpe equals m g and h in order to calculate m if you cover that you've got gpe on top of g and h so 11250 divided by 10 times 15 is the mass which is 75 kilogram part 4 explain why the total amount of work done between q and r is different from the change in gravitational potential energy of the cyclist between q and r so the work done in reality is actually different to the change in gravitational potential energy why is that so since work is done against friction and air resistance while cycling this is lost to the surroundings as thermal energy so in reality you would actually spend more time more energy because of frictional forces the cyclists lubricated the chains and the wheel bearings of the, their bicycles before setting off lubricating the chains and wheels bearings helps it to decrease the amount of work done against gravity now decrease the efficiency that's not the idea increase the efficiency yes that would be correct increase the overall amount of energy transferred by the cyclist no that would mean he, he needs to work harder next question the kinetic energy of the cy and another cyclist is 2800 joules the mass of the cyclist is 85 kilograms calculate the velocity so use the equation they have given you the equation so substitute the value straight away before you rearrange the equation because that gives you at least one marks if you mess up the rearranging part so half times the mass is 85 times v squared so again using the equation triangle ae half m v squared so in order to calculate velocity because it's v squared i need to square root the entire thing so 2800 divided by half times 85 
which gives me an overall value of 8.116 I can write it as 8.1 meters per second that brings us to question the end of question number seven let's have a look at the marking scheme so question 7a the answer was d and the work done was 14,000 uh, not 1,400 the mass of the person was 75 kilograms and some work is done to overcome friction or air resistance energy is dissipated to the environment as thermal energy and part c was correct increase the efficiency of the cyclist and the bicycle and 8.1 was the velocity that we wrote down that brings us to the end of question number seven let's have a look at question number eight question number eight on the is on electricity and circuits this would have been question number five in the combined science uh, high tier paper a technician investigates different electrical devices that are used in a car the technician connects a device to the 12 volt car battery the technician measures the current in the circuit and the potential difference across the device. Figure 17 shows the car battery and the device that is being tested. Draw on figure 17 to show how the circuit should be completed so that the current in the circuit and the voltage across the device can be measured. So remember, to measure the current, you would need an ammeter. So and that ammeter needs to be in series in the circuit. Now, the voltmeter needs to be parallel to the circuit. The technician tests the headlamp. The current in the headlamp is 4.8 amps when connected to the 12 volt battery calculate the power power equals p equals vi or the potential difference multiplied by the current so 4.8 multiplied by 12 or the other way around which gives you 57.6 in two significant figures this would be 58 I'll write it as 57.6 watts next question the technician tests an interior light the current in the interior light is 600 milliamps when connected to the battery of 12 volts calculate the energy transfer to the interior lights in seven minutes now here there's two conversions that needs to be made 600 milliamps is 600 times 10 to the power minus 3 amps 7 minutes multiplied by 60 will give me 480 seconds so the equation is power equals vit the voltage which is 12 multiplied by the current which is 600 times 10 to the power minus 3 multiplied by 480 seconds that gives me a total value of 3024 hmm. I've written it as P calculate the energy E equals VIT so 3024 next question b the technician connects four devices to the power battery each device is connected to its own switch and its own fuse figure 18 shows how the four devices fuses and switches are connected so this is a parallel circuit the current in each device is shown next to the device so you've got this is 0 0.6 amps so you've got 4.8 0 0.6 10 and 2.3 amps the question is asking calculate the current in the wires of the battery when all the devices are switched on so you need to add 
all of these four values. So total current in a circuit is 4.8 plus 0 0.6 plus 10 plus 2.3. That should give you overall value of 17.7 amps. So note in series circuit, The total current is equal to the current in the first loop plus the current in the, oops, sorry. In series circuit, the total current is the same at any point. Potential difference, however, V1 plus V2 plus V3 potential difference is shared. In parallel circuits, the total current is added up I1 plus I2 plus I3 and so on. PD is the same. Next question, state how the overall resistance of the circuit changes when any one of the de devices is switched off. Resistance increases. Now they're only asking you to state how. Reason is since there is less pathway for the current to flow. Three, there is a current of 2.3 amps in the radio when the radio is working correctly. Which of these should be, should the technician choose to protect the radio circuit? So it should be the five amp fuse Remember, that's your fuse symbol, right? It needs to be slightly above the current value. You don't want to use 10 because it's way too much. 0.4, explain why the wires to the battery in a car are thicker than the wires that connect each device to its switch and its fuse. So, since a larger current flows from the battery so there is more heating in the wire Thicker wires have low resistance. So there is less heating and loss of potential difference. across the wire is less. Now, this is actually an extended answer. You just need to say 
since a large current flows through the wire so there will be more heating thicker wires will have low resistance that's why you said thicker wire resistance now this is a good opportunity to revise the factors that affect resistance in a wire so let me make those notes so the factors that affect the resistance in the wire surface area of the wire if the surface area is larger the resistance is lower because there's more uh, area for the uh, electrons to flow through length of the wire the longer the wire the higher the resistance so the longer the wire there will be more chance of collision temperature of the wire higher the temperature higher the resistance material type more free electrons means lower resistance so for example aluminium has three electrons in its outer shell whereas magnesium has two electrons in the outer shell so aluminium is or magnesium or even copper has two electrons in the outer shell so aluminium is actually a much better conductor with lower resistance than copper let's have a look at the marking scheme voltmeter connected in parallel with the device and the ammeter connected in series with the device and 8a it was 57.6 they have rounded it off to 58 watts 3000 joules was the answer and 17.7 .7 was the total current circuit the resistance increases it was the 5 amp fuse an explanation linking to thicker wires have lower resistance less thermal energy is transferred so there is less potential uh, difference drop that brings us to the end of question number eight let's have a look at question number nine question number nine is on in the electromagnetic induction uh, this is for physics paper only so if you're doing the combined science uh, please skip through the uh, this question there is an alternating current of three amps in the primary coil of a transformer there is an alternating current of 6 amps in the secondary coil of the transformer. The transformer is 100% efficient. The size of the potential difference or voltage across the secondary coil is... How do you figure this out? Is it twice the size of the current in the primary coil? Half the size of the current in the primary coil? Twice the size of the current voltage across the primary coil or half the size of the voltage across the primary coil now to answer this although it's a one mark question uh, there's a little bit of knowledge that you need to know so let me make some notes and explain how uh, we can get to the answer the answer is actually d half the half the size of the voltage across the primary coil is the correct answer so how do i know that is the answer so let, let me make some notes so note remember that there, there is two types of transformers a step up transformer and a step down transformer in a step up transformer in both transformers you have an iron core and what I'm drawing is the iron core. So let me draw two of them side by side. And this is a step up transformer. And this is a step down transformer. How are these two transformers different what's different about it is the number of coils in the primary and the secondary coil so that's ac in or the current is going in through that side and the voltage or the current is going out ac out a step down transformer is basically the opposite so the number of coils is much more why is going in and why is coming out the number of coils is much less so we know that power equals the current times the voltage now if transformer is 100% efficient 
then the input total input power should be equal to the total output power so if i replace this power with iv right current in multiplied by voltage in should be equal to the current out multiplied by the voltage out let's say the current is 3 amps I'm multiplying that by the voltage in. So I'm choosing any value for current here. That can only be equal to. So here they have actually said the current in the primary coil is 3 volts. So I'm using the current in the primary coil as 3 amps. I don't know the voltage. And the current in the secondary wall is 6 amps according to the question multiplied by the voltage out. So for this to be equal, this needs to be 3 times 1 should be equal to 6 times 0 0.5. Amps and amps. Right. So hopefully this makes sense. It's a basically as a ratio. So 3 times 1 is 3. And 6 times 0 0.5 will also give you 3 watts and 3 watts. So going back to the equation, uh, question, half the, the size of the potential difference across the secondary coil will be half the size of the voltage across the primary coil. This is what we worked out. Hence, D is the answer. Part 2. Explain how an alternating current in the primary coil causes an alternating current in the secondary coil of the transformer. Now, the way a transformer works is, the question is saying, explain how. How does an AC current here in the primary coil so that's your primary coil and this is the secondary coil. The primary coil and the secondary coil labeled here. Explain how an alternating current in the primary coil causes an alternating current in the secondary coil. So how does an AC in here cause an AC out here? Now what happens is when you supply an AC current because in the coil, there's a magnetic field that is produced. That magnetic field magnetizes this iron core. Because this iron core is connected, it makes this entire iron core magnetic, which means that magnetic field is actually extending to the secondary coil. Now, as the direction of the current changes, because it's an AC current, right? The magnetic field changes which means the magnetic field for this arm in the secondary coil also changes now since this coil is in the secondary the secondary coil is actually in a changing magnetic field it induces a current or voltage in this coil hence you get a voltage on this side so let me write the answer and i'll read it out for you so here's the answer. The AC in primary coil produces a changing magnetic field. This creates a changing magnetic field in the iron core. The magnetic field is extended to the secondary coil. This now exposes the secondary coil to a changing magnetic field, which induces an alternating voltage across the secondary coil. That is more than enough for those three marks. Next question. The primary coil of a different transformer is connected to, to, to the 230 volt main supply. The voltage across the secondary coil is 15 volts. The primary coil has 600 turns. 
calculate the number of turns on the secondary coil. So the equation that you would use, which is available in the equation sheet, voltage in the primary coil divided by the voltage in the, sorry, secondary coil is equal to the number of turns in the primary coil divided by the number of turns in the secondary coil. So substituting these values, 230 divided by the voltage in the secondary coil is 15 volts equals the number of turns in the primary is 600 divided by the number of turns in the secondary which is what we are calculating. So the, when you read in the equation number of turns in the secondary coil is equal to 600 multiplied by 15 divided by 230. That should give you a value of 39.13. Now you can't have, you need to have a full number of turns. So let me round it off to 39 turns. Next question. Figure 19 shows a coil of wire that is being rotated between the poles of a magnet. So this is actually physically being rotated to induce a current within the coil. And when a current is induced, the ammeter will actually show that there is a current. Now, figure 20 shows how the current in the coil changes during one complete rotation of the coil. So, it's starting off at zero, goes to a maximum, comes to a zero, goes to a maximum, and then comes back to zero. The question is asking, this is a six mark question, explain why the current changes in the way shown in the, by the graph in figure 20. Your answer should include details of the positions of the coil relative to the magnet at each of the times labeled P, Q, R, S, and T. So there's five different positions here. So if you describe or point, point out each of those five uh, positions, you should get at least five marks and using uh, diagrams should get you that six marks. So going back to the diagram, let's say I've got North, uh, north Pole on, of the magnet on this side and the South Pole. If I label this part of the coil as A, and this part as B. I'm going to redraw it in the space that I've got here for under the question. So let's say I've got the North Pole. Instead of redrawing it every single time, I'm actually drawing it at both ends, North and South. So I'm going to redraw the shape of the or the position of the coils in different positions in between this space. So you should be able to see clearly. So let's say the way it is in the diagram in the question paper. Right? The current is going in this direction. This is clearly shown in the question paper. If I label that as A, and then that as B. Now, when it flips over, right, because it's actually moving, right, because this is actually spinning, if it flips over, B, arm B will actually be on this side, and A will be on that side. So I'm going to redraw that. Now, when B is on this direction, the current is still going to be in the same direction because the contact contacts would have actually swapped around at the bottom. So you've got B and A, and then let's say. 
vertical to field right so when the coil is straight like this I've got a on this side b on this side and when it's horizontal or flat I've got a and b right this is horizontal so these are different positions i've taken so let's label it as a b c and d that's four diagrams so let me write the answer and then i'll walk you through how to answer this question so the first point as the coil is rotated both sides of the coil cuts across the magnetic field line so when this spins both these parts actually cuts across the magnetic field lines so imagine the magnetic field lines are going in this direction from north to south right so as it cuts across the magnetic field lines right and ac current is actually induced in this arm and in this arm now the current that is induced is it in arm A is upwards and B is downwards, which means the direction of the current in A and B is different, is in different direction because it's a loop coming back. So as the coil is rotated, both sides of the coil cuts across the magnetic field lines, experiencing a changing magnetic field. This induces a PD or current in the coil, its size depending on the change in magnetic field and the angle at which it intersects with the magnetic field. So if the coil stops moving, there is no current. That's why we say a change in the magnetic field and the angle at which it intersects the magnetic field. Now, the greatest change is when the coil is perpendicular. Remember Fleming's left-hand rule, right? Force, field, and the current, right? They, these needs to be perpendicular to each other. So the greatest change is when the y is perpendicular or vertical to the field and zero when it is horizontal or parallel to it. Maximum current is induced as at Q and S. This is referring to the graph point Q and S when it cuts horizontally. So looking back at this, right, the maximum current is produced at Q and at S. And at these points, it should be cu cutting it horizontally. And the minimum current is induced at P, Q, R, and T. Again, in the graph, P, R, and T. And as it's a loop, direction of induced current is opposite in each arms. Hence, when, when one arm is actually moving, you've got the current in this, in this direction. And when it goes to the other side, it's actually going, the current is induced in the opposite direction. This should give you the six marks. Let me show you what the marking scheme says. So in the marking scheme, the answer was D, half the size of the voltage across the primary coil, nine A2 is linking any of these three points magnetic field in the primary coil magnetic field is alternating and the field cuts or links the secondary coil induces a alternating current in the secondary coil the number of turns was 39 and that's a six mark question and here's all the relevant points Coil moving cuts through the magnetic field. Coil experiences changing magnetic field induces a voltage. Size of voltage or current depends on the rate of change of magnetic field. Rate of change depends on the angle between direction of movement and direction of field. Greatest change when coil is perpendicular. Maximum current is Q and R. Coil moving through, moving vertically up at Q and down at S. Direction of current at 
Q is opposite to S. No change in coil moving parallel to the field and we've identified the zero current and coil vertical at P, R and T. That brings us to the end of question number nine. Let's move on to question number 10. Question 10 is on the partial model on the combined science paper. It is question number six. An electric kettle contains 1.41 kilograms of water at 25 degrees Celsius. The kettle is switched on. After a while, the water reaches a boiling point at 100 degrees Celsius. So you can see that the water temperature has increased by 75 degrees. Now this is going to be useful later on. The specific heat capacity of water is 4200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Calculate the amount of thermal energy supplied to the water by the kettle. Give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. Now when they say give it to an appropriate number of significant figures, they usually mean two significant figures or three significant figures. So we can give it to two significant figures. Use the equation selected. So what is the equation? The equation is energy equals the mass specific heat capacity multiplied by the change in temperature, delta theta. So the mass is 1.41 kilogram multiplied by the specific heat capacity of water is 4200 multiplied by 75 degrees Celsius. That was the temperature change. That gives us a value of 440 thousand sorry four hundred and forty thousand yes that's in two significant figures now if you did actually do the calculation the the calculator will give you an answer of four hundred and forty four thousand hundred and fifty as the answer that in two significant figures is four hundred and forty thousand joules next question the kettle is switch, kept switched on and the water continues to boil. After a while, the mass of the water in the kettle has decreased to 1.21 kilograms. The thermal energy supplied to the water during this time was 450,000 joules. Calculate the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. The specific latent heat of vaporization of water is given by the equation energy equals mass multiplied by the specific latent heat. So the mass is the amount of water that has actually been evaporated. Now we started off with 1.41 kilogram and it's decreased to 1.21. So how much mass did it actually lose? That will be 0 0.2 kilogram. That's the mass that we should be using. That gives us one mark out of the three marks. So 0 0.2 multiplied by the specific latent heat, the energy is 450,000 joules. The specific latent heat is given by L, is given by 450,000 divided by 0 0.2. That gives us a value of 2 million 250,000 joules. Remember, you can always use the equation triangle when you're trying to rearrange it. E, M, and L. Next question. B, this question is about determining the specific heat capacity of aluminium. An aluminium block is placed in boiling water as shown in figure 21. So you have an aluminium block here attached to a piece of string and a beaker of boiling water. A Bunsen burner is used to heat the water. The piece of string is tied to the aluminium block so the block can be transferred from the boiling water to the cold water. So the idea is to heat the aluminium block in this water till it hopefully reaches to the same temperature as the boiling water which we are assuming to be 100 degrees celsius and then to transfer it when we transfer this aluminium block to over here 
this aluminum block is going to be at a higher temperature starting temperature is going to be let's say 100 degrees celsius heat is going to transfer from the aluminum block to the cold water by measuring the temperature difference and we know the specific heat capacity of water we should be able to work out the specific heat capacity of aluminum now what the question is asking is describe how a student could use this apparatus and any additional items so we could include any additional items needed to determine the specific heat capacity of water how are we going to work out the specific heat capacity of water from this your answer should include how the student should obtain necessary measurements use the measurements to calculate the specific heat capacity of water for six marks so you need to refer to the equation first of all what are the necessary measurements that you need to actually take now let me write the answer and then we can discuss it part by part so here's a typical answer you could actually separate it out they are asking you to write down the obtain the necessary measurements so here are these points measurements needed the starting temperature of water and that of the boiling water and i've included use thermometer so that we're talking about any additional uh, equipments needed end temperature of the cold water which is the maximum temperature reached mass of the cold water we are going to use a weighing scale mass of the cold water can be calculated by taking the total mass of the water plus the beaker minus the beaker mass only that would be all the measurements what is the procedure allow time for aluminium block to reach temperature of boiling water which we are presuming to be 100 degrees celsius we can measure it transfer the aluminium block quickly to the cold water and stir why are we stirring this is to ensure that the water the temperature energy that is going from the aluminium block to the water is uniformly distributed to heat that water record the highest temperature reached and work out the difference the temperature drop of the aluminium remember it was at 100 degrees we are presuming it is still going to be at 100 degrees minus the final temperature of the cold water why because the final temperature of the aluminium block should be equal to the final temperature of the cold water or the second beaker now how do we work out the results in order to calculate the specific heat capacity of aluminium the total energy lost by the aluminium is equal to the total energy gained by the water this is we are actually making a presumption here there's no energy lost anywhere else so the equation energy from the aluminium should be equal to the energy gained by the water so the equation mc theta mass specific heat capacity and the temperature change the mass of the aluminium multiplied by the specific heat capacity of aluminium multiplied by the temperature change of the aluminium should be equal to the mass of the water in the second beaker the specific heat capacity of water which is 4200 multiplied by the temperature change of the water and when we rearrange the equation the specific heat capacity of aluminium equals the mass of the water multiplied by the specific heat capacity of water multiplied by the temperature change of water divided by the mass of the aluminium multiplied by the uh, temperature change of aluminium so i think we have covered all the points in order to get the six marks now as this is revision i want to point out some uh, important things in terms of the ways of actually improving this uh, the experiment that they way they have done so let me make some notes and uh, come back to so here's some notes that you can make to improve the accuracy and the reliability stir boiling water before taking the temperature instead of assuming that boiling water is at 100 degrees and that the aluminium block is going to be at 100 degrees record the temperature use digital thermometer and a weighing scale to improve the accuracy allow enough time for aluminium block to reach the same temperature of the boiling water by measuring the temperature of the boiling water you're assuming the aluminium block is also going to be at the same starting temperature 
For that, you need to make sure that you have given enough time for the heat to be transferred to the aluminium. Transfer quickly between the beakers. Add insulation or lid to the cold water beaker to reduce heat loss to the surroundings. Record the maximum temperature of water reached in the second beaker. Make sure that you stir. Repeat for reliability. Now these are good notes to make because these are answers for specific questions that they can ask because it's the co-practical. They will ask questions. If they do test uh, you on this, they can ask you questions on how to improve the accuracy and the reliability. That brings us to the end of the question. Let's have a look at the marking scheme. So in the marking scheme, the temperature difference has been worked out, 100 minus 25. So the final answer was 440,000 uh, 440, and 2,200,000. Now the actual answer that we wrote was 2,250,000. Here they're not asking for in two significant figures, so we can leave it as it is. And for the six mark question, as you can see, procedure, measure the temperature of the boiling water, allow sufficient time for block to reach the temperature of the boiling water, measure temperature of cold water, use a thermometer, transfer aluminium block. Quick, uh, the cold water in the beaker, work quickly to avoid, measure temperature of water, stir, measure maximum temperature reach, calculate temperature rise of water by subtracting the initial and final value. Calculate the temperature drop by aluminium by subtracting the final and the temperature. So we've written all of this in the form of an equation. Find the mass of the beaker, use a balance, right? and how to work out the mass of the water and the results. Referring back to the equation Q equals MC here, they have given Q. I have written it as uh, E, it's fine. Uh, the thermal energy gained by the water is equal to the thermal energy lost by the aluminium and they have given you the equation in terms of a word equation and the way we have actually I have done it is in the form of symbol equation which makes more sense if you're trying to understand the procedure itself so that brings us to the end of the video thanks for watching hopefully hopefully you find this uh, useful uh, I will uh, link provide a link for in the description for you to be able to download the notes uh, that I'm making in here in colored form. So thanks for watching. I will see you soon in the next video.